Well, good morning to my 1030 friends at Good Shepherd, Char- uh, good Shepherd Charlotte, Good Shepherd Church of Charlotte. Good morning. good morning. I'm Talbot Davis. I'm the pastor here. Really, really glad that you are connecting with us, either live streaming or live. And this is the third week in this series all about control. It began a couple of weeks ago with a message called Control Freaks and what to do about them. And for some reason, that message had more elbowing than any other message I've ever given. Last week, it was beyond your control. And this week, it's all about what happens when things spin out of control, out of control. Uh, And this message has come in, in such a way that reminds us of something that we believe deeply at Good Shepherd. You may never have heard this, or if you've been here a few times, you've heard it a lot. We believe the Bible is not a book, it is a library. And this particular message series comes from David, as you saw in the video, but some of the diary entries, journal entries that became ancient Hebrew songs, and those are in the book of Psalms. But yet we're connecting the Psalms that David wrote with the life that David lived. And we find out about that from the history section of the Old Testament library. So if you have your Bible with you, I want to invite you to find Psalm 63 and just keep a finger there. That's the, that's the diary, journal, songbook section. And also, if you're feeling super confident with how your fingers and your thumbs work together and all that... Flip over also to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 12, and keep a finger there because we'll briefly, we will connect diary with history as well. And if you're like, I didn't bring my Bible, or I'm not very confident in having the two different places in the same Bible, good news is the words are going to be put up on the screen at just the right time. And, And that's really vital to us that you're able to see the scripture I'm talking about on Sunday, because not only do we believe not book is library. We happen to believe in leadership, something you may be wrestling with. We just like to be clear about where we stand. And, and we believe there's no other library like this on planet earth. God whew, breathed his life into its words. He put his truth onto its pages. We believe the Bible is inspired and eternal and true. And out of that conviction, comes this custom that some of you are already beating me too, you overachievers. When we talk about the Bible here, we lift it up. And again, if, if you're new here, you're like, this is unusual. And it is. But we've discovered that this is a moment of oddity that really molds and shapes our identity as a community. We don't have life figured out particularly well, but we know who does. And so we're glad to surrender to his authority. Amen? Amen. So before I say anything else, let's pray. So God, thank you that you're a good God. And I pray that the same Holy Spirit who breathed life and truth into the scriptures would do the same with everyone within the sound of my voice. So that hearts would be softened and ears would be opened and spirits would be touched by you, Lord. You use my words in these moments to do that. And Lord, I'm just really glad to be able to declare, I am powerless without you, but because of you, I'm never helpless. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So uh, I, uh, I love what we get to do today. Now, now, does that mean that a lot of times I don't like what we get to do? No, I always love it what we get to do today, but I really love what we get to do today because we get to see the sort of bleak way that something starts. And then we're going to look at the really bright way that same thing finishes. And then we're going to go back and sort of excavate all that terrain in between to see how it got there. Isn't that great? We get to start out really depressing We end up really euphoric, and then in between, we go through all the steps. Well, how did this guy get from point A to point B? And all of it, by the time we're done, I really believe that it will give you some really helpful, practical resources to deal with life when life, hello, spins out of control. Because throughout this series, that's exactly what we are looking at. And we're looking at David... The, the, the same David who slew Goliath, the, the David who slept with Bathsheba, the David who, who wrote Psalm 23, 
that David, and, and we're looking at him in a season of his life where his life is so out of control because he's completely under the control, under the thumb of his father-in-law, King Saul. Now, David has this tortured relationship with his father-in-law. And some of you, you may have tortured relationships with your father-in-law too, but, but I, I can guarantee you compared to David and Saul, you got nothing on them unless one or both of you is in jail. That, that's how tortured their relationship was. If you're with us a couple of weeks ago, if you weren't, I'm super glad you're here. But if you're with us a couple of weeks ago, we saw, we saw that, that King Saul, he welcomes David into his family after David marries his daughter. And, and, and he give da- I guess he gives David a house. And then an extra gift with the gift of a house is hit men surrounding the house waiting to kill David. As, Welcome to the family as soon as he gets up, he wants. So David's hiding in a house the first week. Last week, again, if you're with us, David's hiding in a cave and, and, and we get all of that from the Psalms, the, the dire entries that David writes. So today, week one, it's the hiding in the house. Week two, he's hiding in the cave. What's he doing? Week three, Psalm 63, verse zero. And some of you are like, come on. There is no such thing as a verse zero in the Bible. Oh, yes, there is. Because the Psalms, a lot of them, have a little prelude to let you know what are the circumstances in which it was written. And we call that verse zero. So please share this at work with, with, with your co workers tomorrow. I know somebody did it last week and they zoomed. I think they got a promotion and a raise out of it. So uh, we're claiming it, right? Psalm, <laughs> Psalm 63. Verse zero, a Psalm of David. This is how we know it's his diary journal entry. When he was in the desert of Judah. You know what that means? That, that David is an innocent fugitive. That his father-in-law Saul and, and his army has chased David into the desert of Judah, a place that's called the Negev, N E G E V. Negev. Y'all say that. You know some Hebrew. Congratulations. He's chased him into the Negev. And David at this stage, his life is so out of control. And he is a man on the run. He's run from his house to the cave. And now he's run as fast as he can into the desert trying to escape. Hello. His father-in-law. His life is completely out of control. Because Saul is totally in control and David's this man on the run. One other thing you need to know about David at this stage of his life, probably 10 years earlier, maybe 15 years earlier when he was just an adolescent, this happened in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 12. See, I love how the Bible is a library, not book, is library, and I love how we can connect the diary poetry, songwriting with the history. So look what happened in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 12. David's just a boy. So he sent for him, David, and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine adherence and handsome fe- David was hot, okay, and handsome features. And then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. David is going to be king. That's the promise made to him. That's the anointing that the prophet Samuel gives to him in 1 Samuel 16. That's the backstory behind Psalm 63, 0. David is going to be king. That is the promise that the Lord has given to him. And yet when we get to Psalm 63, we, we see that the distance, the gap between the promise, David, you're going to be king, and the payoff, I, I'm king. That that gap is filled with a, a, a legitimately murderous, tortured father-in-law and a rocky, arid, dangerous desert. Because desert living in the ancient Israel, or desert living in modern Israel too, for that matter, was dangerous, dangerous stuff. Hot and arid, and, and, and even today, if you, you go out for a hike in the Negev, the thirst that you feel can turn to dehydration like that, and it can be too late, too, too late, can come too early. 
And then when you think, oh, what I wouldn't give for a little bit of rainfall. And then when the rain does come in the negative, it doesn't stop and the raining turns into flooding. And so what looks like salvation, what looks like really good news ends up being really dangerous. And so wherever you are in the desert, it's nowhere good because it's rocky, it's hostile, it's arid, it's dangerous, and even that which looks like it will save you will end up washing you away in between that promise. And the payoff is this desert. And I don't know about you. Maybe some of you, you... you at some point in your life, you, you heard that promise, you sensed that promise. And yet that promise seems so long ago because the payoff seems so elusive. And you may, might, just like when it rains in the desert and you think it's your salvation, you too may have been fooled by first appearances and something or someone that looks so good turned out to be so dangerous. That's why the guy that you met that time, and man, that guy had it going on, and you were sure this was the man of your dreams, and now you got a restraining order. Or others of you, you you were promised happiness. I mean, you live in a a land where we have the opportunity for life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, and you feel like happiness is sort of your birthright, but the more you chase after it, the more elusive it is. I bet for some of you that that promise that you felt, that you heard, had to do with ministry effectiveness. Yeah, some of you within the sound of my voice, you you were promised that that teaching career would really take off or maybe even that you would become a pastor at some point or a pastor and it would all work out or that you would lead that life group and that life group would be so strong and, and you could have leadership in it and yet you you see the ministry blessings and the ministry flourishing going to other people. And then I know there's more than a few of you here and you feel like at some point you were promised a mate. You're going to find a life partner. And you believe that promise so much with such conviction. You've preserved yourself for that person. And yet the more you look for that person, the more you don't find, you swipe right or swipe left or whatever the swiping is these days and, and nothing works out. There's that promise, and there's that payoff, and there's that gap, and it's just all filled with rocks and sand and heat and flood. And then I know, I know because you tell me. For some of you, the promise is that at some point in your life, you would find relief from that depression. That it would no longer be such a battle to get up in the morning In fact, you had somebody pray healing over your depression. I mean, they very specifically prayed that you would be delivered and you would be healed from that depression. And when that prayer was prayed over you, you felt nothing. And so there's the promise of that healing and there's the payoff that seems so elusive and all that you have in the middle is this Negev desert and life seems so out of control. It was David then and it is us now. And so I want to take a look at Man, what is, what, what is the journey that David takes through Psalm 63? Because you, you, you remember, I, I, I told you a couple of minutes ago, and, and, and I know you were paying attention. It was right at the very beginning. I told you a couple of minutes ago that we're going to look how something begins, and then we're going to look at how something ends. And then we're going to take a journey through the middle it took to get from point A to point B. And so we've seen the beginning of Psalm 63 of David in the desert of Judah, hiding from Saul. Take a look at the end, because at some point, at some point when David is hiding in the desert, and I don't know how it worked on his Apple device, but at some point, Apple sent him a, a journal reminder, and, and it said, David, you're, 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 in the, you're in the desert. It's time to write your journal reflections, and David's very obedient to that app that he didn't even ask for but it keeps asking him to journal. And so he pulls out his device there in the desert. And let's look at how Psalm 63 ends. Verse 11, I love this, verse 11. But the king 
will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him. But the king will rejoice. Wait, 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 wait. But the king will, David's talking about himself. But when he writes this, he's not the king. He's been promised that he would be the king, but he's not the king. In fact, he's hiding from the lunatic Saul, who is the king. And so how in the world does David go from this place of absolute desperation to a place of complete confidence? How does he actually see himself in a role that he's not currently occupying? How does he have the confidence to say, the king will rejoice in God? How does he know that he's going to go from a man on the run to a man on the throne? How does he do that without any kind of boasting at all? And yet with the quiet confidence and the deep assurance that God is taking him there. Well, I can't wait to show you the pattern that comes in between verse zero and in between verse 11, because I want you, you know what I want for you all? I want you all to love the scripture. So you will adore the scripture savior. And I think that if you take a look at this pattern, it's just going to, you have to try hard not to see what's going on. So we're not going to do that. Look at verse one, which is between zero and 11. Can I hear an amen for that? Chapter uh, Psalm 63, verse one, you God, here he is in the desert on his device. You God are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and a parched land where there is no water. My whole being, every, my whole body, everything about me somehow longs for you, Lord. Look, look at verse two. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power. Huh? In the sanctuary. I'm in the desert. And yet I'm remembering what it's like to be among God's people in the sanctuary. Huh? Verse three. Because your love is better than life. My lips, my whole being, my lips will glorify. I'm I'm going to speak it. Verse four, I will praise you as long as I don't have any good answers yet. I'm still in the desert, but I'm, I'm still filling somehow this gap between promise and payoff with telling you what you already know about yourself, Lord, that you're great. And then, then the next part of verse four, in your name, I will lift up my hands. Notice it's still bodily. His whole body's involved. Verse five, I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Again, more praise, more song, more full body. Verse seven, because you're my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. And one more there at verse eight, I I cling to you. You cling with your hands. Again, it's my full body. It's every part of my being. And the steps that David takes to go from being out of control to the king will rejoice in God. I see myself in a role I do not yet occupy. The journey that David takes from being a man on the run to a man on the throne, it is so clear how he fills that gap between the promise and the payoff. And you have to be really stubborn not to see it because it leaps off the page. It's all about David praising God with, not just with his mind and not just with his mouth, but with his whole body. It is this full body praise. It's advanced thanks. Because remember, he's still in the Negev. Nothing has changed in his situation. And yet he's still all about, I'm going to sing to you. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to lift my hands to you. My whole body is going to long for you. And so when you realize, I want you all to love the scripture so you adore the Savior. And you realize the brilliant way that David writes this journal entry, this inspired diary entry. It is so clear what you and what I need to do when life is spinning out of control because we, our promises aren't being kept. It's this, the in between the promise and the payoff is the praise and the praise is the point. 
that, yeah, you fill that desert in your life between the promise of a mate, between the promise of healing from depression, between the promise of ministry effectiveness, you fill that gap between that promise and your payoff with praising the Lord with advance thanks and gratitude before you even see evidence of the blessings in between the promise and the payoff is the praise and the praise is the point now i know this this sounds strange especially especially for those of you who aren't even sure that you are a believer yet or even more so for those of you who are believers, but you're sort of introverts. You're not very expressive. You're not one who when we're singing, you're woo, and you're raising your hands and clapping very easily. That's for other people. And, and for you, for you introverts or newcomers to modern worship even, this just sounds kind of odd. It even, it even sounds a little bit like gobbledygook. You mean in, in between them? Promise and the payoff is the praise and the praises. What are you talking about? I mean, it's, it sounds so so odd that it's a little bit like that guy had a horse and the guy taught his horse to gallop at praise the Lord and to halt at hallelujah. And so one time he got on his horse and praised the Lord and that horse started galloping out in the wilderness and would not stop because he'd heard the praise of the Lord and he's galloping right towards the cliff side and the guy knows he's getting ready to go off the cliff and he forgot the word for halt. And so he kept, he knew it was something religious because he's a peculiarly religious guy. And so he got, Jesus saves and nothing happens and amen and nothing happens and worthy is the Lord and nothing happens. And it's not a book, it is a library and <laughs> nothing happens. And finally, at the last minute, he remembered, hallelujah. And the horse screeches to a halt cliffside and just out of habit, the very religious guy leans back and whistles, woo. Praise the Lord. And <laughs> well, this, it's not gobbledygook. It's not that. It's not fantasy. In, in fact, when, when I say in between the promise and the payoff is the praise, and the praise is the point. This is something that I want the people of Good Shepherd, wherever you are on your journey of spirituality, wherever you are in your emotional health, I want you to internalize that, to practice that. Because do you know what we typically do when we're going through stuff, when life seems like it is out of control? We obsess over our stuff. When's my marriage going to heal? When's my wayward child going to return? When is my depression going to lift? When am I going to find a mate? We obsess over our stuff. And in obsessing over our stuff, we turn into narcissists. And for most of us, it doesn't take much to move us into that realm of narcissism. And yet when you realize that in the middle of your stuff, you don't need to be focusing on your stuff. You, you have a marvelous opportunity to begin praising your Lord, even when the answers aren't here yet, that gets you out of narcissism and into faithfulness. And what's really cool about all of that is, is when you feel life is out of control and, and when you run out of words for your prayers or your praise, the cool thing about the church, and, and I mean the, the, the church global, is that there are people who have been walking this road a long time before you. And when you don't have any prayers to pray, when you just don't got it anymore, man, they have left us this incredible reservoir of written prayers. And, and you, you know, don't, you may not know, there's nothing wrong with written prayers. They're beautiful treasure given by the people of God to subsequent generations of the people of God. In fact, we have one and we're going to throw it up on the screen and, and we're going to pray that out loud and together now. It goes this way. Almighty God, you are the author of life. We are in awe of your creation. The vast oceans reflect your majesty. The ever-changing skies renew our lands. The deep valleys carry your peace and shelter. You are the savior of the world. 
We are amazed at your grace. The nations find peace in your forgiveness, the suffering hope in your healing hands, and the burdened rest in your promise of heaven. Yeah, you, you didn't invent that, but it's okay. God was at work in a lot of people's lives a long time before you showed up, and he will continue to be at work long time after you're gone, in between the promise and the payoff. It's the praise. The praise is the point. And I, and I love the way that Psalm 63 does it, it involve, encourage, evoke full body worship, not just with your mouth, it's not just with your minds. Look at that last part of verse four again. In your name, I will lift up my hands. And I know what it is. Some of you, some of you are like, oh Lord, when the hands go up, the snakes are coming out. <laughs> no. No, it's not that hand raising. It's biblical for one thing. And when we lift the Bible here, we're not playing around. But hand raising is this glorious way of declaring, I agree with what is being sung and, and I agree with what is being said. And the Lord has my whole body because he made my whole body. And hand raising is an opportunity even for introverts, even for those who don't easily express themselves to join in a larger community of surrendered people. I remember the first time that I ever raised a hand. I was already a pastor. This is 30 years ago or so. And, and uh, I was not raised very expressively. Well, I wasn't raised in church. And then when I did go to church, it wasn't especially expressive. And, and I'd see, uh, and I, I was like what I just said. I'd, I'd see people raising hands. I go, oh, Lord, trouble's coming. <laughs> and then one time I was, in a, I was in a prayer room and I was reading scripture and it talked about lifting hands. And I was kind of, I'm not doing it. I'm not, I am not going to do that. That's for other people. I'm not going to do it. And I, I prayed, and by the end of the prayer, my hand was up. And it was like the Lord had worked in spite of me rather than inside of me to accomplish his goals. But, you know, once he does it that first time and you realize I am surrendered to what is being sung, I'm surrendered to what is being said, God has it all because he made it all. I'm still uh, waiting for my payoff to that promise that happened so long ago. I'm still waiting for it. But even though I'm still waiting for it, I am going to fill that gap with my praise. Because in between the promise and the payoff comes the praise, the full-throated, full-body praise. And the praise, good shepherd, is the point. Here's what's going to happen. I want to invite you to rise on your feet as you're able. We're going to be singing a song, and who knows? The Lord might work inside of you. He might work in spite of you. The Lord is going to work to turn you into a Psalm 63 pilgrim with the breath he put in our lungs.